Just let life be. That's what we try here. And now you can hear it. You can hear the cars also. That's also life. But you can hear the, the, the birds, butterflies everywhere. It happened something here which was absolutely uh, amazing for us also. That uh, these sprinklers, they are fed by pipes which were laid on the grass in 2014. And just the same black pipes that you can see there, they are just, were just laid on the grass. And in 2016 we realized suddenly that we had lost our pipes. The pipes couldn't be seen, they, uh, and if you walk in the, into the, the orchard, you, you, you will probably n not see them. And in fact, well, they, where are our pipes? Where did they disappear? And in fact, it's very simple. They are just burned down into the ground. And in 2016, when we, when we tried to find them back, they were one inch under the surface of the ground. Hmm. I'm rolling. Hmm. I'm shooting. Okay. And yes, we are in a place which is a, a special place. We call it the lemon orchard, but I'm under a mango here. This one is an avocado. These two are uh, tamarind. There, Amla, but there is a lot of mango to, of uh, lemon trees here, and this place was um, more or less a desert in 2012, even 13. And it is very interesting because um, we managed to uh, invite life. We managed to create fertility just by putting a bit of water. You can see the, the sprinklers. between the trees in fact and uh, they bring water um, at places where we had the soil of course it was dead but we had the soil uh, we had sun it, because it's between the trees and of course we have air flowing everywhere so just the water was missing and what happened in this place is incredible because as soon as we put a little bit of water uh, something came I, I can't name the, them, the weeds that came, it's not a problem. Came what had to come, in fact, um, spontaneously. We, we didn't sow anything, we didn't fertilize, we didn't put anything on the soil except a bit of water. So weeds, and so two days after the first uh, watering took, we had something. We had something flat, flat plants with flat leaves like that, shading the soil. It was like if the soil was absolutely aware of what he needed, and he, 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 like if the plant that is, it's exactly the plant that the soil needed that was growing at that moment. It was uh, really impressive, and rapidly the plants uh, managed. One came, then it was. Uh, overwhelmed by another one, then again another one. We have had a period where the place was full of nutgrass. Nutgrass which is considered as a terrible weed by everybody here. And then, look, nutgrass is still there, but it's not dominant. And it has been uh, balanced by, by other kind of grass. That's what we call the succession, in fact, the natural succession. And that's how the forests, in fact, Builds up. It starts with grass, starts with small plants, then with shrubs, big plants, shrubs, uh, bushes, and then big trees. And the big trees, which are the base of the um, forests, the T D E F, dry um, tropical dry evergreen forests, are growing. In fact, 
protected in a bush. They, they cannot grow like this in an open space. So they need that build-up. So we didn't want to go to the forest, so I bought a brush cutter after a while because my problem was that the, the grass was reaching the, reaching the sprinklers, so <laughs> my sprinklers didn't work anymore. And um, so I, I bought a brush cutter and I started cutting the grass. And cutting the grass means that, in fact, I was harvesting the gift of nature. I was uh, harvesting the biomass created by photosynthesis and returning it to the ground, to the soil. So I nourished the soil. And the soil be became better, of course, and the grass made profit of it and, and grew even better. And after a while, after maybe one year, one year and a half, grass was growing so fast that we had to cut everywhere each and every 15 days, each, every second week. It was really a, a hassle. So at that stage, we, uh, we invited uh, some helpers. We invited animals in, in, in the orchard. Behind you there is a calf. As uh, the soil was uh, bettering and uh, the grass was growing faster and faster and at a certain stage, after maybe one year, one year and a half, um, no, two years, uh, it was around 2015, I think, um, we <laughs> realized that we, uh, we had created a, too much fertility for, for us, for, it, it was growing like anything and we were cutting the grass every 15 days. So it was uh, not sustainable, in, in fact. It was becoming a forest, it was starting to, to create such an abundance that what wanted to grow and, and there was shrubs and big plants. And we had, at, the, at a certain stage, we had big plants coming, starting to, to come. So we invited the a few helpers, like this one for instance, <laughs> the calf, and we invited also a sheep. The sheep are over there, they are in the, they are there, four of them. And these animals, they help us maintain the, the place. They started uh, grazing the place and of course, uh, we had to maintain a little bit the, the, the place, uh, despite the fact that they are grazing, because there are only four or five, depending on... If we have a calf, we put it here, but for the moment there are five, but usually there are only four, and four animals in this place is not enough for the, for the space. Too much food is available, in fact. We have created a lot of abundance, and this... Um, but it helps us a lot. We, we actually, right now, we are cutting with the machine every two months, maybe two months, yes. So it's a lot of effort which is spared. It's also a lot of um, petrol which is saved. And um, oh, oh. what happens to you? <laughs> Animals are happy and it seems that it brings a new balance in the place. I can't, I can't describe that uh, scientifically, I don't have any justification for that. But my feeling is that uh, if you, you can build a first a fertility um, circle with, with soil, soil and plants, like this. Soil and plants work together. Plants live on the soil, they return to the soil and they feed the soil. That works. That was working here in the lemon of Shad at the beginning. Now we introduce a second level, which is animal.
animal feed on the, on the plant and they they return to the soil animals are supposed to return to the soil when they die when they pee when they poo everything returns to the soil the soil is a the, the place where everything is processed again to become available for life to grow in the plant then in an animal and back and, and that's how it turns that's how fertility increase in fact fertility is just life building up on life living being eating each other thriving dying offering their body and what their outcome to other living beings and that's how it turns here the the wheel of life i would say this can turn and it turns it turns because it's moved by a very powerful engine it's moved by the sun energy is given by the sun the place where energy is captured and used uh, is in the plants plants do the photosynthesis so the sun is feeding the plant is giving energy to the system and the full thing can turn and that's fertility Fertility is not about stuffing your place with NPK, nitrogen, fertilizer, everything. No, not at all. Fertility is just helping this wheel to turn freely. Fertility is a natural um, feature of life. Life builds up. Life thrives. I love the, um, uh, you know, in uh, Taoism. Uh, I love Taoism. Taoism is, is really a philosophy which helps to understand farming. And the symbol of Tao, you know, the yin and yang, is really powerful, is really relevant for farming. And they say something which is absolutely uh, fundamental. They say everything has its contrary. Cold, uh, warm, uh, dark, uh, bright, everything, male, female. Whatever you take, you can have a contrary. There's only thing which has no contrary. It's life. They say life has no contrary. Life has a unique <laughs> feature, which is that it thrives. <laughs> That's it. There is no contrary. You can just hinder it. You can uh, hamper the, the process. But life in itself thrives. That is the base of fertility, that is the base of uh, abundance. Just let life be. That's what we try here. And now you can hear it. You can hear the cars also, that's also life. But you can hear the, the, the birds, butterflies everywhere. It happened something here which was absolutely uh, amazing for us also. That uh, these sprinklers, they are fed by pipes which were laid on the grass in 2014. And just the same black pipes that you can see there, they are just, were just laid on the grass. And in 2016 we realized suddenly that we had lost our pipes the pipes couldn't be seen they, uh, and if you walk in the, into the, the orchard you, you, you will probably not see them and in fact well, where are our pipes where did they disappear and in fact that's very simple they are just burned down into the ground and in 2016 when we when we tried to find them back they were one inch under the surface of the ground. So after two years, because the system was set up in 2014, in 2016, after two years, the pipes were one inch deep into the ground. 
And the mystery is very simple, in fact. They didn't bury themselves with their small legs, you know, pipes, they don't have legs. What happened is very simple. They, the soil grew up on top of the pipe, which means that in this place, we have created one inch of soil in two years. That's completely incredible. I would like scientists to study this place because it, there is something special happening here. Not so special because everyone, everybody could do that anywhere here in this tropical climate. But what is very special is that it's not what we observe around here. Because usually what we observe is that people are destroying the, the cover of the soil. They are cleaning, as they say, they are making it paca. And, uh, for instance, when they sell land, here, when they buy land, they want it to be absolutely clean, <laughs> so they destroy everything. They destroy all the vegetation, they remove trees, they remove grass, everything. But the soil uh, dies when it has no protection, when it has no plant. Look at the wheel. Soil. Soil alone, if you remove the plant, soil alone becomes dirt. There is no more life. Only that can turn and better that, the full thing with the animals. So yes, we discovered that we had created one inch of soil just by putting a bit of water at the right place. We had done nothing. And I, I, I swear, we, we, we had done nothing. We hadn't saw anything. We hadn't put any fertilizer. In 2016, nothing. And what is incredible also is uh, how the tree is recovered. I will show you some trees. I will uh, tell you the story. This, this black high and black trees there are pomelos and these pomelos when we came here in 2013 at the beginning of 2013 with uh, Sylvain my friend and colleague who work here these trees were apparently dead fully dead except that one the, the, the one at uh, the middle which had still had few leaves but really few you, you could uh, have counted them all the others they, they had even not one leaf. It was incredible and we thought if they were dead. And look at them. Look at them. Do they look dead? <laughs> they recovered. We did nothing. We didn't fertilize them. And we still don't fertilize them in fact. Look at it now. That again? Look at them, full of pomelo. This one was the one which was more or less, it was still there. <laughs> it had few leaves, but now, look, it's full. There are pomelos everywhere. And these, which were apparently completely dead, now they are coming back, and they are even giving fruits. I don't remember, but I've seen some of them. Yes, this one, look. It starts giving also. So we did nothing, except let nature work. It's exactly what Fukuoka says in uh, the One Straw Revolution. You know, the, the, the relevant question is not what should I do today? It's more, what should I stop to do? <laughs> of course, it doesn't mean you do nothing. It means that you have to, to have the, the right action at the right moment, but it, it must be minimal, you know, because these processes are, the processes of, of nature, nature processes are so powerful, you know, they, they are tremendously powerful. I cannot create that fertility here. How could I create one inch of soil with my two hands and my mind? That's completely impossible. I can't do that. But I, can't, I can allow that to happen. 
That is the point. So for me, farming is about that. How can I allow natural processes to happen in order to create an environment which becomes abundant, productive, which gives? How can I restore givingness of nature? That's what we do here. So what is the future plan? So what happens uh, after 10 years? What's, what ah, after 10 years, uh, I don't know, but I, uh, I think that these next 10 years will uh, see the confirmation of uh, the collapse of, glo global collapse of our civilization. The, what we call the thermo-industrial civilization, the civilization which is built on the uh, on burning fossil fuels to provide uh, an abundance of energy, which allow us to do a lot of things, which are really funny, I admit, uh, like uh, your camera, for instance, <laughs> like uh, the computer on which people will look at this video, probably like many things, cars, jets, and things like that. That's wonderful. And uh, it seems that we had a dream about it, so we <laughs> have dreamt a lot. <laughs> but this dream seems not to be sustainable. And uh, my feeling that we, we can't uh, maintain the dream so long now. Yes, we don't plug them. In fact, we just wait until they are ready. Yeah, it was ready. <laughs> but you look, this one is not, so we wait. We plug them on the ground. Yeah. Hmm. This one also is full of flowers. You see? It, it shines like stars. <laughs> mm. The smell is so good. You can see the small, tiny lemon coming here. That's a future lemon. And there you have... Oh, she's gone. But we had a mosquito bee, a trigona. One of the mistakes we make is that we are still talking of uh, crisis and things like that. We use this word which doesn't mean anything. A crisis is something which is, has a very precise meaning in medical science. It means a kind of climax of a disease after which you have a resolution, you have a betterment. But in fact we are just diving deeper and deeper and deeper year after year into what we still call a crisis. But in fact it's not a crisis, it's just the beginning of the collapse. The collapse of a certain system which is just not sustainable. So when we reach the limit, <laughs> it collapses. That's all. <laughs> That's very simple. And what collapses is uh, mainly is the, the fact that we have built all our societies or our civilization, as we say, on uh, exploitation of resources, natural resources. Resources which are not renewable. So. What I say is absolutely stupid, and eh? it has been said by so many people, but it has been said but never listened, never heard. People don't, can't hear that. I don't know why. 
So what happens, what should happen in my vision in this farm is just, I would like this farm to become a place um, which demonstrates resilience. Resilience in, uh, means um, that you overcome difficulties, that, that uh, if there is a collapse, the collapse touches you because you are among the others, you are emerged in the society. But you have developed certain strengths that makes you capable of uh, overcome the difficulty and make you capable to continue and for us to continue producing food. So if I have to define the next 10 years, I would like to prepare this farm uh, for a certain collapse of what we take for granted today. Um, the main thing is that we have a lot of resources and we can um, tap into them endlessly. This will end, so I would like to prepare this farm to be able to continue to, uh, um, to produce food, to produce fertility, even if these assumptions de are proved proved wrong, like for instance that we can have endless energy, electricity and things like that. So what does it mean, resilience, what does it mean for us? It means that we must master um, water, we must be able to water um, without using inputs of energy. That is the main point. Um, I think the rest air is permanently renewed it's okay sun will still be brighter above our heads we will have a bit of water coming from the the, the sky rainfall will, will still be there we could that's what was done before in fact we could build a system which would be only rain fed uh, but we know that this kind of agriculture is extremely restrictive. Uh, you can you can uh, cultivate with the rain, you can cultivate millets, you can cultivate some grain, but you cannot cultivate so many vegetables and so many roots and all this rich uh, food that we are used to. So I would like to strengthen the, the farm on this side, the capacity to harvest water when it it rains, the capacity to collect it and to infiltrate it into the, the aquifers. That, for that we are already very good. There is no runoff in the farm. Everything which falls down on our head is kept and infiltrated. The thing is that with our kind of soil we cannot keep it on the surface. It's a sandy soil and water infiltrates very rapidly uh, downward. So we have to let it go to the aquifer. Then we have to pump it back. And to pump it back, uh, we have to have energy. Because pumping back to the surface means having energy. So energy um, can come from the sun. One of our bore well, the bore well, this one, the dairy one, the main one, will be switched to a solar system hopefully soon, but it's a huge investment, so I'm still a bit struggling uh, with the funding. And um, another borewell will be created this side on the, in the mango orchard, um, because this place needs more water, and this borewell is uh, planned to be equipped by a windmill, so we will take the, the energy from the wind. So hopefully, in one or two years, the farm will have three bore wells, one operated with a pump connected to the grid, one operated with a pump fed with the sun, and one operated with a windmill. And this should give us at least a base of resilience. I don't think we, we if some something if things go go wrong, if uh, if TNB, TNB, uh, the grid uh, collapse, if we don't have uh, any more energy, 
that's absolutely sure that uh, we won't be able to maintain the level of activity we have today. That's sure. But at least I would like to um, allow this place to continue to produce food for the community and to produce a base of good food for the community. And for that we need at least two bore well. This kind of energy, windmill and, and, and solar panels, they can they are not, you know, they, they can't produce as much as uh, a TNEB pump produces because you cannot imagine the, the amount of energy we are using without even knowing it. As soon as you are just um, connected to the grid, you know, energy flows so freely that you use it without even noticing it. And this energy, I don't know the name in English, in, fr in French we would say it's a debauched energy. It means that you you use a lot you, without even acknowledge it, without even uh, being aware of it. And that's the problem, in fact. We are sucking the planet without being aware of it. <laughs> so uh, probably the planet will remind us that we have to think about it a bit more carefully. Hmm. Hmm. Can see these ants? They uh, they fight. Uh, <laughs> they eat uh, a lot of uh, pests. You, you mean pest? Okay. The, these ants are a bit of a hassle for us because they bite. And when you work in a tree where they are, uh, they eat. And they, hey, guy, come, come, come. You will see. <laughs> they are really aggressive. But it's interesting because their job is to clean the tree uh, from other pests. And look, their nest is here. That's why. The, the queen must be inside. And if I disturb them, you will see how they... They will come and... Look at them. Hey, come, you! I will bite you. I will kill you. <laughs> no, I, I don't want to disturb them. They do their job, which is to clean the tree. They are carnivores and uh, they eat uh, other pests. So, here are the results of um, the soil analysis that we have made a few days ago. I remember that you, uh, you shot the, um, the packets, huh? um, the picture of the packets. We had um, five samples. This one there is the bare soil, uh, uncultivated bare soil of our orchard. That's how the soil was in 2012, more or less. Then, these one, two, three, and four are the four beds w that we are cultivating according to our methods for now six years. And this one is the average of the four beds. So what is interesting is to see how we go from here to here. What does it change? And it's very interesting because all the parameters are better um, and I can explain rapidly the pH, which uh, about acidity or alkalinity of the soil, uh, went from rather acidic to something mm, not yet balanced, but more close to, to neutral. We went to 5.7 to 6. Point something. And um, then what is very interesting is uh, to see that we double the content of uh, carbon, carbon content of the soil. We were at 0 0.3 and we jumped at 0 0.6. And even one of the beds uh, reached 1, which is excellent. 1%, no, excellent, no, I'm not right. The more you have carbon, the best it is. But we started from 0 0.3% of, of carbon uh, content and um, that's very low 
that extremely low. And we are now in a zone which is around 1%, which means that we do the right thing. And the soil is bettering, and we still have a lot of efforts to, to do and to continue. Then it's interesting to see um, the famous NPK. NPK are there, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. And we were, what is surprising is to see that uh, the bare soil, the cultivated soil, w was already not so bad. You can see the light green here, but what is impressive is that the jump we made on the cultivated beds, all the parameters are much better especially phosphorus, which is really, really better. Can you just zoom in? Uh, I can zoom on it, yeah. No, no, you can just do it. No, I can't with Excel. Here are the, the, four, the three main parameters, N, P, K, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. And you can see the jump, which is... On all parameters, it's bettering. And we are even excellent on phosphorus. I think that it validates the fact that we use auxiliary plants which are concentrating phosphorus in their leaves and as we merge with them we, we return back phosphorus which leads to the bottom of the ground, we return it back to the top soil. Uh, then all the parameters are better, you can see uh, calcium is better, magnesium is better, sulfur is better, zinc is better. Copper is better. Uh, iron. We have a soil which is full of iron oxides and manganese oxide. And that's uh, interesting because uh, iron is uh, diminished. We, we can't explain that for the moment. But it's interesting because it's a parameter which is a bit, um, let's say, heavy in our kind of soil, which is a red soil. And it's red because of this oxide, in fact. So it's a good sign that we diminish this indica indicator. Uh, what else? Even boron, it's still not good, but it's better. What disappointed me a little bit is the CEC, cation exchange capacity, which is slightly better, but mm, it's not so clear. And I think that is linked to the very nature of our soil. And this um, makes me think that we must continue our trials with the charcoal, with terra preta, and all these kind of things, which are not fertilizers. Um, this uh, kind of thing you put in your soil are what we call amendments. It means that you m try to modify the nature of your soil. You don't try to feed it. You modify the nature of your soil. You modify the way it behaves. And um, in this case, what is at stake is the capacity of the soil to hold elements, to retain elements, to store them and to release them when the plants need them. And that's what is the CEC, basically. The capacity to hold things and to release them. And our soil is quite low for that. We know that, we knew that at the, in the beginning. And we try to increase that capacity because as long as the soil doesn't retain element, it means that we have to feed it permanently. So it's a lot of effort. It's like somebody who is always uh, hungry because it, it doesn't make profit of what you give. So we have to feed it permanently. So CEC is for me a very important parameter because I, if we manage to increase it, it means that probably we will be able to stabilize the, 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 the fertility at a high level while doing less efforts. For the moment we are doing a lot of efforts to nourish the soil. But it's a bit like trying to filling a, a barrel which has a hole, you know. <laughs> you fill it but it leaks, so <laughs> you have to fill again. It's a bit like that. So, but in general we are quite happy. And these soil tests have been done at the beginning of a trial, the Terra Preta trial, which is done on the four beds. And we are very curious to know if uh, the 
the amendment of Terra Preta will change that. As these soil tests have been done before, we can see it, of course, we see the, the effect, but in uh, six months, one year, maybe we will have a good surprise. Okay, it's already a good surprise, in fact. Hmm. Yeah, I'm ready. Hmm. Ah, so, if you want me to try to make a synthesis of... Uh, I can't hear you, Christian. Yeah. So, what would be the synthesis of everything? Um, I would say that today it's not enough to be organic in the sense that you just stop uh, putting all that crap, chemicals and things like that in, into your soil or on your plant. It's good, but it's a first small step, it's, it's not a sufficient step. Uh, what has to be done, because the planet is heavily damaged, we have reached a stage where it's not about only stopping damaging the planet, it's about healing the planet. We, we must heal it because the planet is sick. The planet is sick of us. I'm sorry to say that, but that, that, that's the truth. And to heal the planet, we, I think the, the recipe is quite simple. We just have to switch from an exploitative mindset to a regenerative mindset. That is a base. We have to stop sucking, taking, exploiting, and we have to start giving, um, healing, providing, creating. If each and every one on earth starts acting like this, I tell you, the, everything will bloom again. That's not a problem. Because Nature is still there, intact. The forces of life are still there. They are working f with us, for us, even for us. So wh what, it mean, what does it mean, practically becoming regenerative? It, it, it means basically thinking about the way we live, how we are inserted, geared into the life cycles around us. What we consume, what we get in, what we let out also, the waste. What is my relationship with the world? What do I eat? Which kind of object things do I buy and throw out when they are they become garbage? <laughs> and you just try to stop sucking and start producing. That's simple. It's in fact quite simple. For the farm it means for instance that you have to think about your inputs and to reduce them. You you have to have the minimal input you can which means a little bit of energy for the moment we we still can't do without a bit of energy a bit of electricity a bit of petrol to run the tractor for instance uh, the chicken food a little bit of food for the cows a little bit of straw if possible organic but then stop and especially you stop sucking fertility from outside by importing compost. You, you, you do your compost, you produce it. And if you have enough, if you have too much, you can even give. That's the, where we are now. We are st starting for um, a bit more than one year now, we are starting exchanges with the other farms. We have enough chicken litter, for instance, to give to Annapurna. Annapurna has in enough 
ask to give us. So, yeah, we are providers. And it's a really interesting what occurs when you, uh, you have enough, <laughs> when you have a cake, you can share it. But you have a cake only if you place yourself in the mindset of being a cr creator, being a provider, being a giver. The cake is created by nature. We, we don't create it by ourselves. Just sun, air, water, plant grow. That's the gift of the cake. Then if you do it well, you can share it. That's fertility. Then you just return the plants that grow to the soil, you feed the soil, the soil thrives, the plant thrives, and the cycle of life starts again. It's just about stopping damaging nature, stopping, hampering and hindering all the proce natural processes. It's, uh, I come back to the, the, the realization, realization that, that Fukuoka had once when he woke up in the morning and he realized that the, the, the right question was not what do we have to do today, but what should I stop to do today? <laughs> That's important. Of course, it doesn't mean that you have nothing to do. I'm really busy and in the farm we are working a lot. That's not the question of doing nothing. The question is to do the proper thing, to do the right thing, to do the small thing, which will allow something bigger to happen. And the something bigger, that not you who do it. It's nature, the forces of nature. Yes, if I had to make a synthesis of that, it would be about that. Maybe I should talk more about the cycles also, because you realize that yeah, it's about being one. This is something that is said in all the books about spirituality. We are all one. Om. And people are just, you know, thinking the fact that we are one. But it's something that you... It's, it's useless to think it. <laughs> we are really one. <laughs> That's in your guts, you should feel it. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and when you are a regenerative farmer, you, you really feel it. <laughs> you are one because, because you eat what grows on your land. Because, uh, I, I'm sorry, but when... Uh, when you poo, it goes to your land. <laughs> we are completely interrelated. That's important. Life is... Fertility is life building up on life. It means that each and every one on Earth is eaten by others, uh, eating others. Whatever you eat, even if you are a vegetarian, uh, you eat plants and your body will disappear and ideally it should be eaten by the soil and recycled into the <laughs> into the one so it's about cycles in fact we damage nature yes it's good that i developed that because i said just a few minutes ago that we should stop damaging nature and hindering, hampering the processes of nature. But what does it mean concretely? Uh, very often, it just means trying to understand the cycles, the way nature proceeds, and stopping to think linear, to come back to the, the idea of cycling. In nature, nothing is linear. For a simple reason, we are on a planet which is closed, which is round, <laughs> and everything happens in, in, in this kind of aquarium, in this kind of box, and things cannot be linear because it goes nowhere; it escapes out of the out of the planet. 
No, things, the, all the pro nature processes are cycled, are, are uh, plugged on themselves, all of them, all of them. Uh, an animal, for instance, grows by eating plants, for instance. Then he, 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 he shits, <laughs> and, and the shit comes back to the soil, and the soil eats it. And the soil thrives thanks to the, the shit of the animal. Then the soil thriving allows the plant to grow and, and the animal can again graze it. And that's how it works. It works wonderfully. It works alone. We don't have to push it. Uh, the engine is the sun. It works. It works wonderfully. It works alone. We are for nothing in it. So, what we do usually is that we think we are the masters, we think we are God, in fact. We think that we grow plants, so we reduce all the processes into some kind of uh, something that we, we think we master. So a linear thing with a beginning and an end. So there is a at the beginning there is uh, components, uh, material, resources, and we will put our effort and our brain, our intelligence along the chain. At the end, we will have an end produce and we will sell it and make money. But it doesn't work. That's not how it works. This mindset is exploitative. We destroy the resources, we create a lot of pollution, and at the end, our home is damaged. So as soon as you see that you are in this attitude of thinking that there is nothing that you will create something by putting inputs, even seeds, you know, even seeds, I realize that we are still on that because we, we, believe, we still believe that uh, we have to sow seeds to get the, the crop. And that's still true, we, we must, if we don't sow cucumbers, we won't have cucumbers at the end. But in fact, what is amazing is to see how many plants spontaneously came in our orchard without being sowed, you know, they just came. Birds are bringing seeds, wind is bringing seeds. So. And a plant is never as healthy as when it's sowed spontaneously like this. It's incredible. When you sow something, when you plant a tree, you're very proud of your thing because you think you have done something. But in fact, it's so fragile, it's so unhealthy in comparison with that, what came, comes spontaneously when the nature is in charge. That's really incredible, the difference. We have seen that during the cyclone in 2011 also. Uh, the trees we had planted for 40 years, most of them, they just fell down because they had no good roots. The root system was damaged by the fact that the, these plants these trees ha had been raised in nursery, in, in plastic bags, and then planted and things like that. And the trees uh, which resisted were mainly the trees uh, which came spontaneously. So it doesn't mean that we, we should not have planted them for 40 years. No, no, no. We have created a wonderful forest in Auroville. But it must remind us that to remain humble. We the trees we planted were very, very useful because they allowed the next generation to come spontaneously. They shaded the soil, they protected the soil, so we created the first step of fertility. But then you must admit that the real thing is never done by you. It's done by nature. So that that, that is for me my sadhana, my yoga, being a farmer. See, what is the right action? Because 
Of course, I, I, the farm is supposed to nourish, to feed the community. So I can't wait until the cucumber grows spontaneously. It will never grow, probably, because cucumber is not a dominant plant. <laughs> so I have to, I have to open a place for them. I have to sow them. I have to raise them. So, but what is the minimal way to do it? What is exactly the right action? I have to to do at, a, at, at the right moment in order to let the cucumber grow according to nature forces. That is the point for me. I think the Japanese people, they call that the Wu Wei, that is translated li in uh, something like uh, non-doing. Um, it's really, uh, uh, I think, a good, good uh, thread to follow. It's exactly w also what is uh, requested from us in Orville, the, the Karma Yoga, which is a, a yoga, um, a practical yoga, the practical of doing things, but. Mother said you, you you should be the willing servitor of the divine consciousness, something like that. Um, and that's exactly, exactly, exactly the same thing I'm talking about. It's about doing, it's about being at the service of something which is greater than you. She said divine consciousness, you can call it uh, as you want. But it, it, nature, the one, G give it the name you want, <laughs> the, the result is the same, it's about um, cultivating in yourself the capacity to feel what is requested from you at a certain moment and just to have this action and only that one and stopping projecting yourself, your mind into things through the will of reaching some stage or realization or result or something like that. That's a daily yoga. And then you become regenerative. Because nature is regenerative by essence. <laughs> and you just become part of it. So it's not an issue. You are regenerative. <laughs> what can I say? How do you want to conclude? I don't know if I can conclude that. <laughs> I already concluded a lot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah. Maybe I can say something that, that is interesting. That maybe it's not. Uh, it's a bit an heretic uh, kind of uh, speech of uh, thought, but I deeply feel uh, the coherence, the adequation, the, the fit between what mm, the founder and mother said about Auroville and what we are supposed to do here, the Karma Yoga, and farming, re regenerative farming. There is a... For me, it's a... Uh, sorry, words are missing in English. But yeah, I could say that the. M <laughs> ah, let me say that the most perfect. Uh, one of the most perfect way of um, embodying, of manifesting what uh, Sri Aurobindo and Mother tried to convey through their somehow esoteric formulas like uh, divine anarchy, like uh, being the willing servitor of the divine consciousness and things like that. All this can be found quite easily, naturally and perfectly in the relationship, in the 
respectful relationship with nature through the farming. Because you are dealing with something which is immense, which is nature. Call it nature, call it mother, call it what you want. It's about the same thing. It's it's a force, a tremendous force that gives us, that nourishes us, that feeds us. It's mother. F fundamentally, it's the mother. I feel the presence of the mother every day in the farm. It's, I don't know if it's a word that exists in English, uh, givingness. I don't know, if, uh, but it's a word that comes to my mind. I feel the giving, givingness of mother every day in the farm. I relate to this givingness. Generosity, abundance. Yes, and this experience is a fundamental experience because it, uh, it, it allows you to root into something uh, which uh, can be a foundation, foundation to all your actions. Can be, which can uh, also calm your fears, calm your anxiety. Yeah. And it's difficult to be regenerative when you are. Uh, moved by fear. <laughs> you never take good decisions by fear. <laughs> In fact, what you do when you take decisions grounded on fear, you create scarcity, which is a dominant paradigm. What happens when you can uh, relate, when you can contact, when you can feel into your gut the abundance which is uh, given to you by nature, by the mother, suddenly you become able to create abundance in, in your turn, you, you can create abundance and you... If, yes, and what you manifest is um, is abundance and yeah. and then you can share and for me it's also very important because we are in Auroville supposed to build an economy, a gift economy but giving suppose uh, implies to have something <laughs> to have an abundance if you don't have, if you, have, if you are in, in scarcity, you cannot give, you cannot share. So, for me, the first step is relate to abundance. Maybe it's not so clear, but relating to abundance and being regenerative are for me the two sides of the same coin. That's what we try to do here. Okay. One minute m about yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> So, I'm, my name is Christian, I'm French, I have uh, three children, I raised five, I'm a civil engineer, town planner, but when I was 50 I changed completely my life, I came in Auroville, and after one year here I became a farmer. I took over this farm and I converted it in, uh, into organic and gener regenerative farming. So here I am.